Welcome back to the weekly news roundup. I hope you guys had a wonderful week. Let's get time for the weekend. Let's see what type of crazy stuff was going on. Today we have our usual suspects. We have a privacy roundup. We have a security roundup. We have some AI news. We have some business. And of course, we have to end in Sillyville. So these are recorded live Fridays, 8 p.m. Eastern at Standard Time. If you'd like to catch the show live, go ahead and join us there. And for the people that send the occasional comment like, is it Standard Time or Eastern Time? because it's, it's, dude, whatever eight o'clock is in New York City, that's when we film, okay? This is not complicated. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, I, I get a couple of those uh, fun comments. They're fun to pick on occasionally. It's kind of like the people with no YouTube channel that say, you have a great channel. You could really improve if you do this, this, this. Thank you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and get diving on into the news. First up, Australians are increasingly concerned about online privacy after high-profile cybersecurity breaches. You'd think that Americans would get this as well after the Equihax um, debacle a few years back, you know, where like every single adult in the United States had all of their data leaked because Equihax decided that six months later they weren't even going to patch a known highly uh, insecure Apache server. An Apache server. Wasn't like nobody shut the server down and did DNF update on a server that could have stopped it. Nope. Uh, which I still think that company should have been shut down. Um, but over here in Australia, they apparently have a few brain cells rubbing together. They might need those brain cells rubbing together to prevent the the island from killing them because you know, all sorts of the crazy stuff like everything out there in Australia is out to kill you. So, um, that's what they're seeing. So uh, what they're saying here is um, there were a, uh, a survey released um, and they found three quarters of Australian field data breaches are the biggest re- risks to privacy they face. A th- increase of 13 percent now the positive side is now we are over se- about 75 percent but that's only up from like 62 percent and they still passed all these nonsense laws requiring every company to collect every bit of data points that they possibly can with of course penalties if you violate certain policies it's like dude okay stop saying we're going to give you penalties it's like you know i've seen your penalties like the whole facebook cambridge analytica stuff eight years later facebook is paying out two dollars and fifty cents everyone involved thank you for almost the cup of coffee at star socks okay really <laughs> come on this is this is not accountability all right you need to if you're going to say you're going to be punished for violating these policies you have to make a company hurt so bad the whole company's like up in arms and starts firing people and golden parachutes are cut off Okay, when that happens, we're going to start seeing positive things occur. But that's not exactly the type of stuff we see happening. Um, but, and I was reading through this going, ah, blah, 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 blah. It actually has a positive spin to this article because at the bottom, they kind of talk about what the rules are. What they're saying is the citizens at this point, based on the surveys, by and large, want to get laws passed, making it illegal for any company to collect any data beyond what is immediately necessary and to hold any data longer than is immediately necessary and to delete any data when specifically requested to do so. And so when these factors are put together, then this actually turns into something that could very possibly be something very good and positive. And so Australia, take the lead, guys. Take the lead, Australia. Take the lead and then export that law all over the world. (laughs) Let's go, Australia. I'm rooting for you, buddies. (laughs) <laughs> All right, TikTok is facing fines for violating children's policy, uh, looking at an $820,000 fine uh, for um, for their issue. Now, this actually ties only to one and only one issue so far, although more things are in discussions right now. What this has to do with is in the EU, TikTok's privacy policy was only published in English. And, of course, EU is not primarily English-speaking, of course. Um, and so what the, uh, what the EU regulator said is that since you were not publishing your privacy policy in the native language, kids may not have understood it as easily, and so you've taken advantage of the kids. I just think uh, it's idiocracy to allow any of your children under the age of 18 to be on that 
crappy platform. Anyway, but uh, that's a completely different point, and I don't think that should be regulated. I think, and I don't have any good solutions, right? Uh, that's the unfortunate reality is we live in an imperfect world where all sorts of stupid happens all the time, and there's really not much we can do in regulating it probably is not the solution, but eh, whatever that happens to be worth. So that kind of boils down to what the one rule is, although there are other things looked into because I have a pretty sneaky suspicion that behind the scenes, EU's entire fundraising protocol is simply to spin the roulette wheel, uh, which consists of all the names of the big tech company. And as soon as it goes there, they just investigate them for something and end up finding them millions of dollars. And that's, I think, how the EU is is raising money these days, is just extracting funds out of these big tech companies. Like, oh, God, the, our numbers come up on the wheel. How much are we going to fork out this month? Great. But um, that's what TikTok is facing. Back to the UK. We're jumping all over the world here today. Uh, I think our last one's actually in America. So, you know, we are being a global news. All right. Uh, over in the UK, the UK minister defends plans to demand access to encrypted messages. This is the thing that the whole world is watching right now. Uh, WhatsApp and Facebook uh, with, uh, excuse me, WhatsApp and Signal uh, have both stated that they are going to pull their servers out of UK if this rule passes. Apple kind of uh, took up the mobster tactics. It'd be really bad if we'd have to leave uh, because of iMessage, of course. The basic summary of the rule, if you're new around here and uh, we haven't seen uh, or don't know much about this one going on, uh, UK is trying to pass a law that allows law enforcement to have a backdoor access to any form of encryption. And this has, of course, serious fundamental negative consequences for the world. But that being said, they're still trying to push it and they're trying to push all sorts of the stuff to say, oh, yeah, this is what we need to do to make everything better or whatever else. But the reality is this is going to be bad for everybody, which is why every big tech company is kind of pushing back and saying, no, of course, this uh, UK minister is running around screaming for the children, for the children, for the children. I have a thought back to the previous story. Why don't you monitor what your kids are doing online and we don't have to worry about it? Because, you know, if you're like a 14 year old or something and uh, you have competent parents around and then I understand you can't sit there and perpetually monitor a 14 year old, but it starts with good parenting at home with having a precedent that doesn't have a Everybody addicted to smart technology. It has a precedent that says I'm not going to uh, provide my child with one such phone. There's all sorts of these issues like this. And because of these individual things, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that that we cannot live in a perfectly safe world without giving up our privacy. And uh, I do like the framers of the American Constitution, which would happen to say he who would give up some of his privacy for some of his security desires and neither. And that is the reality. I'd rather have that that privacy and uh, let me take care of my own family. And uh, I'm not going to let my kids on that type of content. And uh, you should be monitoring them and teaching and training them. You cannot control what a 15-year-old is going to do. You generally can control what a 9-year-old is going to do. And some of those are more susceptible to this nonsense than others. And that's why I don't think young kids should have phones. Even when you need to get them a phone because they need a phone, would they need to call home? Which I get the argument a little bit better now because there's not pay phones everywhere. There's not a phone at every house anymore. But you don't have, that doesn't mean you have to give them a, a fully internet ready smartphone. I mean, my friend is dumping his internet ready smartphone for a simple flip phone now. And so that's the, the trend we're starting to see an increase in those dumb phones. And that really is a important point. So there is what UK, the ministers over there just screaming for the children, for the children. And uh, that's the case. On to our final story in privacy tonight. An innocent pregnant woman is jailed among faulty facial recognition, uh, recognition trend. This happened in Detroit, and this is the third arrest in Detroit for, um, uh, for the false facial recognition. And, of course, she was a woman of color, uh, which facial recognition technology has a lot of false, pos or false, uh, false positives on uh, black people, not nearly as much on white people, but still there is some, uh, some false positives um, uh, for, for the pasty folk out there as well. Uh, 
And uh, with the use of facial recognition software led deploy, Detroit police to falsely arrest a 32-year-old Por- uh, Portia Woodruff for robbery and carjacking. Now, here's the thing. The facial recognition said this must be the lady. They had pictures of the event going on. It was a very slender person. And this woman is eight months pregnant. It's not like, oh, pregnant. She's like two months in. No. Eight months. She's like, she is so pregnant, she's waddling around. Don't tell me that the penguin is out there, nah, 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 give me your car, nah, nah, nah. What did she do, rob you with an umbrella? I mean, come on. Uh, but the cameras very clearly showed it was not a pregnant woman, but the facial ID said this is the lady. She had a previous arrest, I think, in 2015 for some previously unrelated crime. And so, like, eh, our work's done. We let the computer do it. And that's the laziness of the world. Now, of course, after... Um, uh, she was arrested. Her phone was confiscated. She was thrown in jail for uh, a lot of money for bond. And then eventually, about a month or so later, all the charges were dropped. Well, she's actually now suing the police department, uh, which exactly has to happen. Uh, because what they're doing is they're relying on this technology, but it like everything else, once technology becomes pervasive in what we're doing, we over-rely on the technology. And in the over-reliance on the technology, we we really start to skim off the top the responsibility or the difficult work or even the real police work. It's like a computer said, therefore, we're going to do it. And uh, just a little tip that... I kind of, there's an element of that in my first short story on the supporter platform. So um, <laughs> you want to check that out. Uh, but, uh, with this, uh, with how this is set up, then, um, the, uh, basically the, the people here, uh, involved, the police here did not do a lot of solid police work. They didn't say, Hey, this woman's massively pregnant. And the person, the security footage we have isn't, maybe this is the wrong person. No, nah, they just said, eh, she has a mugshot. The computer says good enough. And that's it. Oh, and one more thing. The, the victim of the robbery, uh, picked her picture out of the lineup. Uh, which, of course, if computers have a hard time with uh, um, darker faces, um, people do as well. And that's probably part of the fundamental problem of using it. It's not racism. It's not intentional bias. It might just very possibly be uh, a fewer number of bone structures or a number of different things. It's like BMI. Um, you know, uh, people, I, I think it's... Um, uh, I, th- I think it is also the, the black population on average has a slightly higher BMI. So you can't just say take BMI as a blanket, um, a blanket point of, uh, of health universally across the board because different races naturally have different average levels of BMI. It doesn't mean it's any more or less healthy. It just is a, a reality and a fact. And that's the problem that we have with utilizing these uh, systems. Well, if you want to help support the channel, we do use affiliates. Today, I want to highlight Linode. Linode is what powers a lot of my client servers. It powers our restreaming server that we are using right now to stream this show live on five platforms simultaneously. That is done through a uh, small account I have on Linode. We also have a private VPN over there. I have a private Jitsi server over there. All sorts of fun stuff you can do on Linode. And uh, it's not all just like, oh, I'm going to put all of my personal stuff in, in the cloud. No it's a lot of tools that I use for my privacy. My own private VPN is a good thing for me because I can be confident that I'm not going to be tracked down with by somebody else on the server or some other company in, in the background. Um, I also have, you know, like I said, I have client websites over there and Jitsi servers and things like that. These are all things that I use fundamental to keep my businesses and, and other properties working. So all that happens on Linode. TLM.li forward slash Linode is going to get you $100 in credit. Good for 60 days. You can spin up as many little Linodes there as you like and give it a try. See what happens. Uh, Jellyfin servers, VPNs, web hosting servers, all sorts of fun stuff. With that, let's head on over into security. And first up in our security, digital assets continue to be a prime target for malvertisers. We've covered this in the past. This is just uh, kind of a more of a reminder article than anything else. And uh, now they are specifically more targeting some NFTs as well. But this deals with your malvertising campaigns is what this is called, where uh, they're actually going in. And this is this is the argument for using 
like ad blockers. Like people are like, oh, ad blockers, you're going to take revenue from the internet. The problem is that a very, very, very large percentage of ads are malicious. So here's, for example, now these guys, when they were doing a quick search for this particular service, they were not able to find it on uh, the Google ads, uh, but they were able to find it on the Bing ads. And in this case, uh, what happened is, uh, and this does happen on Google, lots and lots of instances of these is Google as well. It's just not on this one particular service, probably because it had been reported to Google. Um, so they look up this particular service and there are two simultaneous ads for this NFT marketplace. And uh, the first one is actually malicious. The second one is the legitimate site. The legitimate one is looksrare.org. This is looksrare-org.com. Okay, a hmm, little suspicious there. But uh, it is still, these show up. I mean, Etcher, Rufus, these are applications that we talk about in the Linux world quite a bit to burn a distro onto a USB drive. Those have also been caught up in these malvertising schemes. You have to be careful that you're not clicking on a malicious ad anytime you're, you're doing something there. And so the reality is, yeah, these ads are problematic. Uh, and so if you look at the details, here's the advertiser details. Yeah, definitely looks legit, doesn't it? <laughs> Fan fantasy clicked, uh, fantasy spelled incorrectly, click limited. There you go. Uh, from this guy's name. <laughs> looks legit, doesn't it? So uh, here's the how the decoy reject works. So these are Bing ads. It goes to the uh, the Bing uh, the Bing. Um, target marker here. This links into your Bing analytics so you can measure the effectiveness of your ad. This is going over into looksrare-org.com, uh, which is a malicious site. This is redirecting you to the site slash about us.html about us. And um, that is actually having some malicious type stuff to it. Now we can see what's going on and it's problematic, but the machine doesn't necessarily know. And so none of these companies are doing anything about these until they are specifically uh, specifically reported. But this raises a serious question. This has been going on now for months, if not years. And the reality is... This is devastating stuff. So you get over to that site. This is that. Um, uh, this is the the particular site. It's a scam uh, site, but it still pops up a uh, a QR code that you can enter with your phone. This is going to link to a crypto wallet, and then now they will have. Uh, access to drain your entire wallet. And that's how that type of uh, malware is occurring. Moral of the story is run ad blockers and do not click on ads, period. And I'm sorry that, uh, I'm sorry that that's so bad. I mean, you need to turn off your ad blockers. We'll turn off the ad blockers when A, you stop being intrusive and B, you stop sharing malware as a, as a service. Uh, cloud account takeover utilizing evil proxy hit over 100 top level executives of global organizations. Uh, this does appear to be the cookie harvesting system that took down sites uh, uh, or some uh, a malware like this is the one that hit Linus Tech Tips, for example. And so this one here, what they're doing is they're utilizing a phishing scam, which gets you to click the link. And then the malicious site is going to harvest your cookies and your various accounts. And this allows you to. Uh, allows the hacker to redeploy your browser in their instance and bypass your 2FA because your browser is already trusted. And so that's what this is, allows you to do. Of course, they're selling this as everything is as a service, right? So this is the phishing as a service. Uh, P-H-A-A-S. Isn't that great? It's so wonderful that we can, have, we can, we can buy phishing as a service. Sounds, sounds great. Um, sounds like something you do over the Love Canal or something. Uh, so from Engadget, Colorado Education System uh, Department discloses data breach spanning 16 years. Yep. For 16 years, the entire life of your child, you know, uh, hackers have been hanging around inside of our network, just stealing all of the data willy nilly that they felt like stealing. Literally, they have been logging in and there's just been some other hacker sitting there in the corner. Oh, cool. Let me grab that data too. Oh, well, that's fun. Oh, let me grab that data. Oh, yeah. Look at that data. Mm, yeah, look at that data. 
And so um, officials are investigating a ransomware attack from June, affecting an unknown number of students all throughout the Colorado system. Of course, also some teachers and other things like that, gaining pretty much everything. So if you uh, had a kid in this Colorado system, pretty much all of their information is compromised because, you know, we absolutely know that the school absolutely has to have every bit of information. About we have to know his exact birth date and his exact social security number and everything about this kid. Blah, blah, blah. There are ways to lock this kind of stuff behind security without compromising the privacy. Um, and as long as these incompetent buffoons are running these security or these allegedly secure networks, uh, we have to take these proactive stances. Uh, but yeah, for 16 years, hackers were in there doing whatever they wanted to do inside of it. <laughs> Sounds great. And a cyber attack has disrupted hospitals and healthcare systems in several states. I think one of the main problems is hospitals are becoming so interconnected. Big business, of course. You got to trade us millions of dollars to save grandma's life. <laughs> what do you want, your money or your grandma? <laughs> All of your savings belongs to us. Um, but uh, with that, though, the um, uh, what the happened here in this hack is they got in here and uh, let's see hospitals and clinics run in several states by Friday began the time consuming process of converting from cyber attack that disrupted the computer systems forcing some emergency rooms to shut down and ambulances to be diverted primary care services facilities run by prospect medical holdings remain closed so that spans several states including some here in Pennsylvania where I'm filming at right now uh, also, uh, some of the nearby states also down as far as there's some Texas some Connecticut, some Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. Um, these are all places. Um, basically it's been, it was one central company, one central company organizing all of these medical clinics. That central server was shut down. It cascaded down and shut down everything under the purview. If there has ever been an argument that no corporations should run massive groups of hospitals, that would be it. They all need to remain independent. So if one of them gets shut down, the one down the block probably isn't. That's the type of stuff that needs to happen. But when UPMC comes in and starts ravaging hell all over every single hospital system in the tri-state area and turns everything into a big business, skimping on every bit of service and pushing all the good doctors out, you're asking Asking for this type of crap because they're skimming everything off the top. They're skimming everything off the top. And security is that one thing that everybody skims on and nobody thinks about until it actually becomes a problem. The, the issue is once it does become a problem, it becomes the biggest problem you can possibly face in our current world, which is completely driven by data and technology. And so we have to be very careful because these hospitals are shut down because they're skimping on security. It's about the dot bottom line and it's about foolishness in how the systems are administered and deployed. If you'd like to help support the channel, we do have a series of ways to support. Uh, today we're highlighting Patreon. Patreon.com slash T-O-M-M will support all of the channels that I do. And uh, over here we will have the uh, the exclusive content for the, um, uh, for the short stories coming up. I'm not sure exactly what level on Patreon. I might do the five and up level. I'm not completely sure yet. So, um, but uh, over there on Patreon, you can jump on over there and uh, help support the channel. Keep the lights on. With that, let's head on over to security. Excuse me, AI news. We're on to AI news next. And uh, with our AI news, <laughs> we get to see some lots of fun stuff. So this first one is from Wired. It's a deeper dive into uh, two of the chat GPT clones that we have talked about in the past. Um, and one of those being Worm GPT and the other one, uh, I'm sure it's in the article here somewhere. I just forget exactly which one it is. Uh, basically, these are uh, oh Fraud GPT, Worm GPT and Fraud GPT. There it is down there on the bottom of the screen. So these are large language models that have allowed... The fraudsters, at least allegedly, and the article says allegedly it's unclear if these actually work, but the reality is, yeah, I think they're certainly doing something. Are they the best, amazing, top-notch, highest quality? Most likely not. Most likely, as this Wired article points out, it's probably just the scammers scamming the scammers. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're loving, is this is that at that point in time called scamception, that we happen to get a case where the scammer is making a scam, selling the scam software to the scammers? And uh, then what are they going to do if they turn around and say, well, this thing sucked. It didn't actually give me the things that I need. Like, ha, 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 sucka. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's scamception, like I said. 
Uh, but it, sever, it covers uh, a lot more detail, the worm GBT and the fraud GBT, both of which we've covered previously, and how those are language models that have basically taken what um, chat GBT and the open source models available have done, and they've you know taken all the safeguards and trained it with a lot of bad stuff and done a lot of training on emails, just basically to make more effective phishing emails, more effective scamming emails, uh, more effective at figuring out the holes in people's individual securities. And so that is some of the stuff that we start seeing inside of there. Uh, this is a good article, of course. Uh, just a reminder, all of the articles are linked to the uh, post over on switchtolinux.com, which is in the description down here. You can read all of the articles yourself. Zoom had an AI debacle over the last couple of months. Uh, back, back around January, they silently added a uh, tweak to their terms of service that very few of us ever read. And uh, in that, they basically said, yeah, we're going to use anything and everything that happens on a Zoom call, train AI. Awesome. What could go wrong, right? Well, once people uh, started learning about this, it caused a lot of outcry, and the company has since backed off on this and said, okay, we'll not do that. So now they say, confirm in a blog post that the video conference maker will not use audio, video, or other customer content to train its artificial intelligence without customer consent. So they're still going to do it as long as uh, they have your consent. Most likely that consent, I mean, I haven't used Zoom in a while, but most likely that means that the consent means that um, uh, it's in there and you have to contact us to opt out. That's probably what we're looking at, but uh, you never know. You never really know. So that is what is going on over in the world of Zoom with their AI nonsense. AI researchers claim a 93% accuracy in detecting keystrokes over Zoom audio. Of course, this would work with any form of audio. We were wondering what those Zoom guys were doing with that data. Figuring out your passwords. <laughs> hmm. Bad feeling gone. That was a joke. That's not what they were doing. This is a, a, this was a study used using Zoom audio, but it wasn't run by Zoom. At least I don't think it was. Uh, but this is a research report. UK researchers Joshua Harrison um, and a bunch of other people's names I can't pronounce. Uh, the trio claim the ubiquitous machine learning microphones and video calls present a greater threat to keyboards than ever. Laptops in particular are more susceptible to having their keyboards recorded in quieter public areas. Of course, depending on how your microphone set up, the microphone may internally pick up the sound or it could externally pick up the sound. So what they were doing is they trained all these on Mac models. Um, so they used, um, uh, where were those at? Uh, should be up here somewhere. Uh, they all used uh, all the study was done using Mac, and uh, it was done over. Um, it was done on a Mac model. They have used the same keyboard for uh, the previous three consecutive years. Okay, there you go. Uh, 2021 MacBook Pro to test their concept La uh, laptop that features a keyboard identical in switch design to the models from the last two years and potentially those into the future. They typed on 36 keys 25 times each to train their model on the waveforms associated with each key. Then they used an iPhone 13 mini 17 centimeters away to record the keyboard's audio for the first test. The second test, they recorded the laptop keys over Zoom and then using the MacBook's uh, built-in microphones with Zoom's noise suppression set to the lowest level. In both tests, they were able to achieve higher than 93% accuracy with the phone recording audio edges closer to 95-96% accuracy. So so um, basically, uh, these researchers, uh, according to their own admission here, um, intentionally gathered the data of what Apple keyboards sound like and fed it into AI systems to train AI systems to identify keyboards. Great. Now that's unleashed on the world. Um, what bad could possibly happen? Now uh, AI scammers will be jumping into Zoom bots and instead of going around and dancing around with like, you know, um, um, rope loops and stuff and things like that to, to cause a rise, this is going to get on there very quietly very friendly, very peacefully, like they're supposed to be there, collecting all the audio and analyzing whose uh, passwords are what. Hmm, that'd be interesting to see. Uh, but uh, that's kind of how the study worked. Thank you for unleashing this nonsense on the world. Now, uh, now AI across all the microphones in the world can crack our passwords. Sounds great. <laughs> all right, ChatGPT is uh, a bad knowledge base. So, of course, if you're wondering about this, um, think instead of orange man bad, this is green AI dumb. Uh, so ChatGPT, of course, is being um, basically assumed to be correct in almost every case. Everyone's asking things. It's become part of the cultural zeitgeist. What it says is being pushed as true. You're seeing this in Bing. You're seeing this in uh, in Bard. Not, of course, not ChatGPT. That's Google's version with Bard. They're pushing out the same type of stuff. 
basically we are relying on this and assuming that whatever the um, AI spits out is completely correct. That is what the assumption here that they're doing. The problem is they have found out through some research paper that uh, Purdue University that uh, that's actually not correct. What they did is they gave the chatbot 517 questions on the topics found on um, Stack Overflow. 52% of ChatGPT's responses were incorrect. And when Stack Overflow, uh, when asked Stack Overflow to do the math for us, they came back with 48% of the chatbot's responses were correct. And so the reality is ChatGPT is wrong slightly more often it's right. It's roughly a 50-50. And so it's not nearly this amazing model that we should be placing a lot of trust in. It's going to cause a lot of problems. And indeed, it already is. Call me a Luddite if you want, but I think that the introduction of AI like this into the society is going to cause a lot more issues than it's going to solve in the long run. I think that that really is the the case that we are going to start seeing. And so that's uh, what the, the paper says. So it's a uh, fascinating little read well with that if you want to help support the channel we do use affiliates today we are highlighting nord vpn uh if you happen to need a nord vpn uh or a vpn of any form or another and not everybody does i'm not the guy that's going to sit here and say everyone needs a vpn you have to have a vpn no not everybody has to have a vpn there are specific legitimate cases where you should have one there's Cases where you probably shouldn't. Um, but if you happen to need a VPN, Nord is one of the good ones. There are a number of good ones out there. Nord is one of them. If you use our link here, tlm.li forward slash Nord, that will help support the channel. And you'll get a good VPN that has worldwide nodes, has some extra speed, and will keep you safe if you are using the internet from things like coffee shops or if you need to bust out of a geolocation or things like that. Those are the legitimate reasons why I need this. Uh, do you need Nord? VPN on every single network connection you do from home? Uh, no, not necessarily. Of course, if you completely mistrust your ISP, you might think about that as well. Uh, but that is kind of where, where Nord sits at. So uh, with that, we are going to jump on over into business news next. First up in business news, uh, experts find 43 Android apps in the Google Play Store with 2.5 million installs that display advertisements while the person's phone screen was off. You're like, hey, that's the best time to display an ad. It is, but the reality is, is that uh, that is actually costing the businesses that are buying those ads money, and it is being disingenuous. Now, uh, who's at fault for this necessarily? Obviously, the developer who is doing something such behavior is problematic. Uh, of course, though, Google professes this is the best and the safest place. You shouldn't install anything except from our amazingly curated Play Store, which is where all the malware is. I'm telling you, if you want, if you want clean, good, safe Android apps, the last place you should install them from is the Play Store. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, F Droid is great. Um, everything on F Droid is directly audited. Um, ad fraud campaign was covered by McAfee, targeted mostly Korean Android users. But basically, what was going on is the ads were running while the phone was off, which it could lead to. Um, excess unknown network usages could lead to lower battery, but the biggest concern is for the businesses that were paying money for ads, they were charged money for displaying the ad that there was zero chance anybody actually saw, which basically meant that they were being defrauded. Now, the question is, were they being defrauded by Google, who's the one who took the money and served the ad, or were they being defrauded by the ad company or by the app company who put the ad to run at a time the screen was off. Um, more, more of the blame certainly is for the latter than the former, uh, for sure. But um, the fact is, is that we need to make sure that the if you're paying for ads, you need to make sure that people are seeing those ads if you're charging them money for it. So uh, that is an interesting little side business news. Um, absurd, of course, uh, Lewis Rossman covered this one this week. Uh, Google and, and Amazon rebuked over unsupported Chromebooks. Uh, also not here in the article, but not in the headline, Walmart also. Basically, if you can buy a Chromebook online, it is very possible you will buy a Chromebook that is already reached end of life. So no security or feature updates planned, but they are still selling these as new Chromebooks. There is no warning that these Chromebooks are 
end of life. So here they provide a link to Amazon and to Walmart that these laptops or these, uh, this is a flip C302 is $550 from Amazon and $820 from Amazon Marketplace. They're providing the links, although uh, Illustrative don't support those. I wonder if those are still live. Let's see if that's still live. Actually, I may not be able to tell because Walmart's been doing this thing lately where they're forcing you to log in like that. Isn't that great? Somebody just emailed me about that. Um, it's like, it's, it, I'm not sure that not all of my computers are doing this, but I cannot go to Walmart's website and just look to see if a local store has something in stock. It redirects me over here on nearly every computer. But before it redirected me, yes, it is still selling that computer for $819.99. Uh, that's a steal for a Chromebook that you probably can't install Linux on and does not receive any more security updates. Awesome. Walmart. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so you need to be careful here. They provided uh, screenshots. Every one of these devices no longer receive any form of security updates. And so you can still buy them. They're still listed as new. There's no warnings anywhere about these being end of life. These are 13 Chromebook models that are expiring this summer. So if you are in the market for a Chromebook, um, then just make sure that you are looking up this list. Again, this article is linked in the description down below. Um, it's linked on the blog post, which is in the description. Um, there's three Acer models. There's an open, uh, an A open model. There's three Asus, a Control, a Dell, an HP, a Lenovo, and two Samsungs. Uh, all of those will expire in the next couple of months. Uh, between June and August that, well, hey, hey, look, I looked at my watch, um, took my watch off to charge it. Um, so, uh, those guys are all expired, but still to this day, still being sold as new devices with no warning about it. They have, um, the organization here making this stuff known. Uh, they have sent a letter to Google asking them to continue to support these devices. Of course, Google's like, me, 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 me. Um, because they just want to buy stuff. I mean, we talk about these big companies like, we got to protect the environment. Go green, go green. We're doing all this green stuff. Yeah, we're just selling you otherwise perfectly functional stuff that we're not allowing you to install an alternative operating system on and we're not providing you security updates. So we basically just need to take all this stuff and just throw it in the landfill and start over or scrap it for parts or something. You know, there is a fundamental problem with all these companies preaching to us about you got to save the planet and then uh, them obsoleting something that is otherwise not broken literally support the thing or provide me a way to support it i'm not saying google has to support these devices what i am saying is maybe google should push some form of firmware update allowing us to support the devices and say hey these are out give them a pop-up screen these are out we've unlocked the device you can install linux on it and linux can support it for as long as you know, the, the cows are floating around. So that's, you know, that's what, what should be happening. But they, they don't care. This their planned obsolescence because they're not going to make more money if they keep these things around for another decade. They want you to buy these things for what they have, use them. They want you to throw them away once there's no more security updates. And then they want you to just buy a new one. Now, to be clear, they will still work. They are just not going to receive any security updates. You may or may not care about that. It depends on what the purpose of the device is. If all you're doing is accessing some, you know, just accessing some generic websites and there's no personal information on it, pff, who cares, you know, uh, whatever. But if you're actually trying to do something serious, you might want the security updates. Uh, YouTube no longer suggests videos if your watch history is turned off fascinating. Uh, so what they're going to announce here is, I'm not sure if this is rolled out for everybody or if this is still just one of their, their crazy tests. Uh, but the what they're doing is if you turn off that watch history, they're like, hey, we're not going to show you any recommendation. We're just going to give you a screen that says, here's your subscriptions. Enjoy. So that's kind of an interesting take. Uh, that might be, uh, I don't know, is that a positive thing or a negative thing? I am completely not decided. So um, definitely let me know what you think um, in the comments down there. I think overall it's good. If I turn off the, the watch history and all you're doing is providing me a link to the things I've subscribed to, that actually might be better. That might be better for those of us, uh, like for people that uh, maybe channels like mine where 
we have 60,000 people subscribing, but not a lot of people watching it necessarily. And some of that might just because the, the YouTube recommended is so bloated with crap. And I'm noticing that myself right now. There's more bloated crap in there than I will ever look at. And I will don't care to look at any of it. Um, but I'm starting to see it showing up. And that is certainly a uh, problematic thing. So I think this might overall be a good thing. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. And uh, final is uh, we have a new Linux distribution for your M series Max. This is a Fedora remix. And so uh, this is, of course, for the newer Max rolling out with the better chips, like the, the new M chips coming out. So uh, M1 and M2 based laptops from Apple. And uh, this Ash is Ash uh, Asai Linux. I think it's Asai Linux. Is that called Asai? I don't know. Um, so Asai Linux. It is uh, basically a, a, a fork of Fedora, uh, Fedora Asai Remix. So announced at Fedora's Flock Conference this week in Cork, Ireland, um, and on a, a, a size Linux block. I'm going to call it Asai. I apologize if that's in, incorrectly pronounced. Um, officially released by the end of August. So just give it a few more, a uh, few more weeks to have it officially out. You can try it out now, but there are some rough spots in it. And so what it's going to do is allow you to run um, run Linux on your M2 Max. So uh, Hector Martin, writing on a size Linux blog, notes that the existing project based on Arch Linux was fully downstream. Asai is adding its own package repository with scripts, forked kernel and Mesa packages, bootloader parts and user space support, but with no significant involvement with upstream Arch Linux ARM um, and Arch Linux. So uh, with that, uh, new options out there. If you happen to have one of these M2 Max, you want to play around with this, you can go ahead and uh, give that a try. Did I just really say ARM instead of ARM? Trust me, I, I'm a computer expert. <laughs> hey, at least we actually run this show entirely on Linux. I, I The number of videos that I'm watching right now, there seems to be a proliferation in Windows notifications. And I have a sneaky suspicion it's all of the ads because more and more and more times I'm watching videos, I'm hearing the Windows notifications showing up in the video. You won't hear that from me because I'm not using Windows. <laughs> Well, if you want to help support the channel, we do have a uh, merch store, shop.switchtolinux.com. We have amazing things like this amazing coffee cup here with that alien and the tinfoil hat. This is the uh, the nighttime theme. We also have a daytime theme where the alien is over the moon. Of course, this hat is the same general logo, and we do have this very amazing mouse pad, which this mouse pad is now, I think, five or six years old. It is starting to wear out, finally. Starting to wear out after six years. Longest I think I've ever had a mouse pad actually work. We have a number of different uh, designs over here, and we have a number of different items. Hey, you can even get an alien with uh, on a onesie. Look at that. Uh, we do have coffee cups. We have mugs. We have water bottles, hats, mouse pads, shopping bags, just all sorts of fun stuff with a few different designs. We do need a few more designs out here. I don't know. Should I do with designs, or should I ask the community, do you guys want to make some Switch Links designs? I don't know. Um, send me some thoughts, but here, of course, coffee cups with cats and tinfoil hats. Um, I don't know. That's kind of cute. Uh, those are both the kitties. So one of them's over here staring at me right now. Going, are you showing that picture of me in a hat again? <laughs> yes, I am cat. Yes, I am. It's a cat in a tinfoil hat. All right. Uh, so you can head on over there. Shop dot switched to Linux dot Com. And now your favorite place and mine. Let's head on over to Sellyville. See the kind of crazy nonsense is going on in our world. First off, Elon Musk offers to pay legal bills of people unfairly treated for posting on his platform. This is really good for the little guy who gets uh, some form of uh, legal punishment for doing something like posting a meme or even worse, NASCAR drivers liking a meme, which may not mean you like it. It might just mean um, you want to see it later. It may mean you're appalled by it. I mean, how many times have you posted something tragic like, hey, I just found out I have brain cancer. Pray for me. And then you got a whole lot of people hitting the like button. Trust me, that's not the whole internet saying, I hope that you die of your tumor. Um, that's not exactly the case, guys. No, no, that's not what that means. It's just a sign I see and I acknowledge. 
All right. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you should have the personal right and freedom here in America to like, dislike, say or not say whatever you'd like to say or not say without having, you know, losing your job and stuff like that. As long as, of course, it's within the scope of of legal stuff. I mean, don't be like a Provo guy posting stupid stuff on you know, social media, duh, what do you think is going to happen? Um, but, uh, at the same time, uh, if you're just simply, um, being a jerk on social media, join the party. <laughs> really? Um, but he's offering money to help pay legal bills of people unfair, unfairly treated for posting on his platform. So that's deep. Uh, so the co-founders of ocean gate, um, you know, the imploded Titanic sub, they have a new idea. They're going to colonize Venus. <laughs> Great. The people who couldn't even do basic testing on putting a submarine down there would like to land a spacecraft on a planet with an ambient temperature of 100 or 800 uh, C. Um, yeah, sign me up for that one. I mean, as long as we can... Never mind. I was going to say something, but eh, my, that may not be good. Something, something about certain certain people with uh, you know fences and something being the first on the trip. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Billy boy, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, so um, basically, they're saying, yeah, we we have our sets, uh, our sights set on exploring outer space. And uh, he wants to send 1,000 people to Venus by 2050. Uh, planets, uh, oh, it's it's 900F, not 800C, my fault. Um, but there you go. There's Alma burning in Venus, um, a.k.a. hell, I guess. So, for the record, one of our spacecraft surviving the surface is just over two hours. It was designed to withstand the grueling environment. But if Ocean Gate is any independent, um, this is not, uh, he's not interested in things like keeping people alive and doesn't want you to be either. Forget Ocean Gate. Forget Titan, forget Stockholm. Humanity could be on the verge of a big breakthrough and not take advantage of it because we as a species are going to shut down and be pushed back into status quo, he said. Yeah, let's go ahead and create a new colony on Venus's atmosphere. Okay then, guys. Okay then. Sounds great. <laughs> Uh, meme makers rejoice. A new driving school instructor has crashed his car into his own driving school. Uh, so uh, that's the scene from Terminator. Uh, yeah, you think of the the think was uh, the the instructor is no longer employed by the driving school. You think uh, this is uh, is window parking going to be on the test? There you go. And here is actually a picture from it. Um, so this is the, the actual tab here. Let's see if it actually loads or if it redirects me to log in. I don't know. So here is the learn to drive school and here is the car sticking out the window. Uh, of course they say over here, let the memes begin. Um, so I downloaded a copy of the picture here. And, uh, if you follow me on, uh, uh, Twitter or Gab or Minds, uh, you know that I posted a meme about this already today, and my meme about this happens to say, this is what I get for using Windows for my full self-driving car. So there you have it, guys. You can uh, learn to drive, too, uh, by driving the car into the driving school. Sounds great. Okay, and uh, next, of course, we used to have that little um, middle school joke, oh, over the shoulder, bother, holder, you know, when the, the girls are, you know, getting their training bras on. Well, now we have an over-the-shoulder tumor detector uh, because this uh, Nigerian entrepreneur, and it's wondering, it's Nigerian. Is this a scam? I just don't know. So the Nigerian entrepreneur thinks uh, that this bra can detect breast cancer. So uh, on the hype of we got to constantly be screening for this kind of stuff, she creates this uh, bra. And from what I was reading on the article, uh, it sounded like she was mad because people were being a little bit sexist towards her or whatever else. So she decided she's going to do something great for, for, uh, um, um, humanity. Um, I'm not going to say humanity. That's just too racist or sexist. Humanity. Um, and she decided to create this bra full of all of these radio sensors that are allegedly going to help detect breast cancer early. So, 
Uh, it seems slightly uncomfortable to me, but I don't know. Um, are, are bras generally comfortable or not? I don't know. We have about a, a 1% to 2% uh, ratio of women on here, and I haven't seen our representative women on here yet. So let me know, uh, somebody, uh, are bras generally comfortable or uncomfortable, and does this look more or less comfortable than your standard run-of-the-mill Calvin Klein? Um, I assume they make bras. <laughs> Can't say no much about bras, okay? Uh, believe it or not, I'm not Britain. I don't wear them. <laughs> Okay. Um, we were not allowed to do electrical connections, she said, but I insisted I participated and it helped find my bearings. That's kind of like the anti-man part. So she ventured into wearable technologies 2019. First thing I had in mind, developed a device that could detect breast cancer in its early stages. Of course, the idea here is to detect it early so that you can treat it early, blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of where uh, she has this guy, this guy going. But it's very interesting technology to see exactly what's going to happen. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? I don't really know. Uh, I do know if you want to help support the channel, you can jump on over to Locals, switch to Linux.locals.com. You can jump on over there. We will have our first short story revolving um, involving modern technology gone rogue uh, will be posted this next week. So stay tuned for that over on Locals and on Patreon and Subscribe Star and Think Life Media. It'll be available all those spots. With that, you can help support us on Locals at switch to Linux.locals. Dot com. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.